Oh, wow, wow. Here we are at Michael's. Thank you. Thank you again. So yeah, there is an A9 wandering around. Nice, you got it. Please feel free to take pictures. Um, if you want to take notes, of course, take notes. What we're going to do is try to spend as much time going through, I think, the advantages of mirrorless that maybe apply to everyone, some a little bit of specific details, but if we have specific questions, we'll hang those questions till the end. I will make sure I have a timer on here. I'll make sure that we leave, what, what did we say, about five minutes, oh, roughly like yeah. that, five minutes left for your questions. And if you don't get, if you think five minutes isn't enough, I'll still hang back and we can still go through some questions. Personally, we have a little table of gear, we can do that. So without further ado, the mirrorless advantage, what's it all about? So whether you're new to photography or want to do some video or, you know, really serious portrait photographer, um, we have a whole bunch of cameras that can really do a fantastic job. And this really represents probably um, our flagship cameras. So we've got the A7R4, the A9, the A7 III, uh, all around her. We also have a brand new camera, an A9 Mark II, which is in my hand. It's pretty speedy. So in general, these are all full frame cameras. Um, there are some things that are very different about our cameras to your conventional, let's say, DSLR. And uh, that means actual physical things are different and technology is a little bit different. So we're going to dive into that. So hopefully you're at the right talk. We're not going to be uh, doing a macro photography class today. It's all about the advantages of mirrorless. So hopefully you're here at the right place. So compact and lightweight, what does it mean? So um, sure, of course, the obvious stuff is that you can put it in a small bag. So we do have APS-C. Uh, cameras, so a little bit smaller. We do have the larger, like I said, full frame cameras. Um, but there's a couple things that you want to think about when you think about long, uh, lightweight um, and compact. It's not just carrying it around. I think many, many times I speak with people, they go, ooh, I'd feel really weird going to like a family event and trying to take a picture with a big camera, right? That's a big hurdle for people who are getting started. So to have something that, hey, it's over my shoulder, doesn't really drag me down, um, I feel comfortable putting this camera in front of someone else. And that whole like, uh, you know, that connection between you and the person you're photographing actually becomes a lot, a lot easier, right? Because sometimes as much as we love camera gear, we love lenses, we love that, really it is about the photographing when you're photographing people and friends and special moments, you really almost want the camera to, to disappear. And so uh, being compact and lightweight really is a massive advantage for someone just getting started and maybe is a little bit shy about, you know, taking photos of those special moments. Um, now, if you're a little bit more serious and you want to go for a big hike uh, or a big, you know, uh, Australians and, and myself included, uh, like to travel all over and they like to bring a camera. Um, that's probably one of my favorite parts about Australian culture is that everyone really does, you know, go and travel and not just have holidays, but try to have adventures. So if you're into you know, hiking, bushwalking, that kind of stuff, there's plenty to see in Australia itself. Um, and sometimes that camera can be the thing that slows you down itself. It's, it's, you know, it's great for capturing images, but if it's a big bulky, uh, let's say DSLR, having a slimline uh, mirrorless camera with less parts and it, that is actually designed to be smaller in the hand can be that difference between, yeah, I took the camera out today and the next day and the next day, so you can actually get into a rhythm, right? So in many times photography, it's not just bringing the camera out there, it's you know, kind of really observing what's around you. And of, of course, there's, there's a long catchphrase, a very old catchphrase saying, the best camera is the one that you have with you. And if you've gone ahead and you purchased a really nice camera, you really want it to be with you all times, especially when you're on holiday. So again, that's a massive advantage. Um, basically, you can be much more mobile uh, than before. So um, this, you know, there's not, it's not very text heavy, this thing, but the idea is you can get down in, into places that maybe you wouldn't necessarily think to bring a camera. Obviously, at a sports event, you would, but maybe traditionally you'd sit a little bit further back. You wouldn't kind of like, you know, lean out into the, to the, to the space and really capture that big wide angle shot. So in many ways, being able to bring that camera along and get it into uh, hard to get to places can make a difference between a good shot and you know an exciting shot, a dynamic shot. So this is what our cameras look like from the top. So there's not a whole lot of space to put too many dials. So we think very critically about how we're going to use the space on the camera. Um, now I will call this out because we're going to talk about this in a little bit. We're going to talk about exposure in a little bit. This big gnarly thing here, uh, which does take up a big chunk of uh, the camera, is called our exposure compensation dial. Uh, most people. Uh, probably in this room, uh, maybe 
might every once in a while, if they hand the camera to someone else or just getting started, might go into auto mode. And so this really doesn't do too much. Everyone else who's you know, super duper keen can use manual. Uh, this is their mode dial, which gives you control of aperture, shutter speed, ISO, all those things, which is great. And then most people we find use some kind of semi-automatic um, mode dial. And that's totally cool, right? Because if you put it in shutter speed, that's all you're worried about, the camera does the rest. If you put it in aperture, you're controlling aperture, camera does the rest. Now, when you have a camera like this, and you have this big dial, I always get the question, what's this for? So what you want to think about with a mirrorless camera is when you have this camera, oh, there we go, sorry. When you have this camera to your eye, which we'll get into a little bit deeper, you're not looking through a mirror anymore, you're going to see what the picture's going to be. So right away, you can say, ooh, that's too bright, and you can go ahead and pull that down or pull that up if you're in a semi-automatic feature. And that's why it's big, and it's right there on that thumb for you to be able to shoot it. So if you are also, right now, using our camera, thank you very much, to take photos, uh, this is that shutter button. So make sure you're pressing that shutter button throughout this presentation. So I won't get too bogged down by that, but I will call out we have some people here who have maybe not the smallest hands in the world. So this maybe doesn't work for them, that's fine, this is our small, lightweight, full frame setup, out of the box. This is an extra grip extension that you can purchase, and this is the big vertical grip with two uh, batteries. And uh, again, we got a shutter on the side, so when you hold it vertically, uh, in the vertical orientation, you can still have full control. It lets those big, chunky fingers just kind of sit a little bit more comfortably. And uh, actually, the grip itself is something we've been improving on as well for people who, who want to use long lenses as well. Cool, so I did mention the electronic viewfinder and the live view mode. I'm not really crazy about PowerPoint in general, so I will plug in a camera and show you what I'm talking about. It's a little bit hard to follow just the PowerPoint, so I, I will be doing uh, a live demonstration. So mirrorless cameras, electronic viewfinder, what is all this going on here? So essentially, this on the top is where we would traditionally see uh, pentaprism, I think we would call it. So just think of a reverse periscope. So you would traditionally look through here and you would be able to see out the lens using a mirror. It would be flip flapping up and down and you can see through the lens. So that's a typical DSLR design. That's all gone from here. When you're looking through this viewfinder, you're seeing a small uh, display, so electronic display and you're getting not uh, necessarily, well, there's no mirror, so you're getting the actual readout of the sensor. So the sensor is showing you right here into the eye exactly what the picture is gonna be. So you're getting a live view. So what, it, what does that look like? So sure, you have it in here. That's that dial is pointed out. So let me just show you what we're doing here because I think everyone wants to see what, what I'm talking about. So let's see. Is it going to accept this? Is, does anyone in particular not want their photo taken? Just raise your hand. I will make sure. Okay, I'll avoid there. I'm just going to generally shoot in this area. Maybe the camera. Okay, so here we are. So we might decide that's uh, maybe too bright because it's a dark room. So I'm just going to pull that control dial down. And that is the photo I'm going to take. That's a lot of photos I'm taking. So you can see what you see is truly what you get. And when you're in very challenging conditions, which we'll talk about, indoors is pretty tough. You know? If I was looking through a DSLR, I would just see the ambient light. So if I was shooting, if I, someone messed with my camera settings and I <coughs> took my aperture to f16, a really, really small aperture, and I had only 100 ISO, I might take a black frame. I might actually take a black picture. And that moment is gone. Right? You can go ahead and recreate it, but if it's an you know, event or something like that that's a little bit important, you want to know that what you've seen is what you're going to get, and that is a massive advantage of what um, our cameras can do. Uh, obviously, all mirrorless cameras can do this as well, um, but the critical part is that now for someone who's just getting started, they, have, you know, they don't have to like relearn all the technical side. They can really explore the creative side. Uh, we were having a conversation earlier that um, you know, sometimes this definitely can get in your way as a photographer and you can't, you know, you're not really paying attention. What's in the background? What's in the foreground? What's, is the person smiling? Are they falling asleep during the picture? Not sure. So these are things that, again, allow the photographer to really get into that creative mode and take those photographs. 
Um, now, we also get the same um, view on the back of the screen as well. So what you see in the electronic viewfinder is basically the same you'll get on the LCD screen. The important thing is our cameras are designed to be used either way with no drop off in performance. So other previous uh, uh, DSLRs, let's say, uh, once you turn this screen on, the whole autofocus system had to change and there would be you know, some, some drawbacks to that. Uh, but this is how the cameras are uh, designed. So when it comes to that exposure, that what you see is what you get, is super important, let's say, if you're more advanced. So once you're in a very dynamic situation like this, where you get the big bright sky, uh, you still have some deep shadows here, having that exposure compensation dial is gonna be right away, it can inform you whether it's too bright, it's too dark, and help you balance, balance that exposure to your liking. Um, now the other thing with uh, our cameras is automatically in the viewfinder and on the LCD screen, you'll get a depth of field automatic preview. In some previous, some other flagship DSLRs, what you'll get is you have to hold another button and let you know whether, you know, whether that background is blurred out enough, whether the subject's in focus enough. Um, I'm not here to bash DSLR. I'm really trying to let you know that right away, you know, like I think this was shot at F4, F4 is gonna get the job done. If it was maybe F1.2 or maybe you miss focus. So you're not only getting the depth of field preview, but you're making sure that that, that image is in focus straight away. Um, now, yeah, it gets quite challenging sometimes to get these shots in focus when you're using a very, very large aperture. This image was taken with a 135 mil lens at 1.8. Obviously, it's very nice. And I think um, what it really does let you know as a photographer is, okay, is this person far enough in the background where now I can see that they're not affecting the picture? Whereas if you're looking through, again, a mirror, it would all look like your, like your eye sees it pretty much. Uh, this is a, a pretty tricky one in a good way. Um, we have a thing called uh, manual focus assist. So are there any macro photographers in here at all? One, maybe two, maybe three hiding. I know we hide sometimes, it's okay. I like macro myself. Um, so what we can get now um, is in the viewfinder. So let's see if I can show this. Because we're not looking through here, we're looking through, again, a little LCD screen in the viewfinder. Um, let's see if I can get a nice little picture of something here. Let's see. Ooh, batteries. Batteries aren't that cute. We'll try that. Okay. This is a little bit on the fly. Okay, so I can try to get an autofocus situation here. Okay, that's nice. If I go into, let's say, direct to manual focus, I kind of get the best of both worlds. I get that, and then punches right in. Obviously you wouldn't do 20 frames per second during a macro shot. So what we're able to do here, and again, this would happen in the viewfinder, I would be able to make sure that I have what I want in focus. Cool. And that's the picture. That is the preview. And that's the picture. So that's the, again, massive advantage to mirrorless. You just couldn't do that previously with DSLR. Doesn't really like me jumping back and forth. Lucky I'm a crazy guy. All right, so that's enough for that demo. Now, going back into the presentation. Oh, that's such a nice picture. I just put it in. I just put that picture in, so nice. Um, look, when it comes to low light situations, again, you're looking through that viewfinder, right? It's gonna give you just about this picture in the viewfinder. Whereas if you're in a DSLR, again, I know I'm kind of hitting it. If, if really what I'm trying to explain is that there's a many, many genres and many lighting conditions where it's gonna be super helpful to have that, uh, what you see is what you get kind of preview. Um, all right, moving on to autofocus. Uh, autofocus is a big deal in many, many ways. So this is what you'd find in a conventional uh, camera. You'd get your mirror, you get your shutter box, and once you start taking those things out, you have to find a new way to find focus. So previously, you would have somewhere, let's see if we have a picture of a camera somewhere. Here we go. Ooh. So in our cameras, all our autofocus points and megapixels all live on the sensor. In a traditional DSLR, you'd have a second autofocus sensor at the bottom. So you're not really working with much light, which is why our cameras can have autofocus points across the entire frame. We have what's called hybrid autofocus. I know this seems very techy. Um, essentially, 
What it means to you, if you want to take your photo, is that a flagship DSLR really is using that center of the frame, and that's why I think a lot of people had to use like center and, or sorry, focus and recompose methods, which is sometimes hit and miss. Um, whereas now, we do have focus points all over the frame, and also very advanced uh, eye autofocus detection and face detection. So I will show you what that looks like one more time. Let's have a look. Again, if you really don't want this kind of point at you, just, just point at me and, or just raise your hand, I'll, I'll just move away. So what does it mean to have focus points all over the camera? Um, all right, let's go for it. Let's see, I'll try to avoid that particular light there. Hi, sir, how you doing? So this is in direct to manual focus. This is continuous. Now we have it set to wide, so normally a DSLR, I'd take the photo here, but I can start there and, ooh, getting some interesting flare. Again, it's holding that eye despite the glasses, despite the low light, and if that was a picture I was more interested in, ooh, no, I'm not gonna go sideways here. Again, maybe I wanted to pose it like this and maybe put it off to the corner, off center. Or if I wanted to go here, similar. So again, that's all in focus, that's all happening now. Didn't take the photo, but if you want a photo later, I could take a photo. So that's really, again, the idea is it really can unlock your creativity. You can think about things um, from a creative point of view of where you want that person in the image as opposed to getting kind of bogged down like, ooh, it's not in focus, is it in focus? There's a phrase, um, it's called chimping, which is this whole thing. And I, I found myself doing this the other day in preparation for this talk. I went and I shot with a DSLR camera, find photos, but I did find myself doing these, doing these, zooming in, doing one of them, and just making sure it was in focus. And, and how many shots did I miss when I was doing that? I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I wasn't shooting anything very dynamic, but at the same time, if I was, I just want to know that the photo's right as I'm still taking photos and taking in the scene. So again, being able to unlock your creativity, trusting the autofocus system, uh, really is a massive thing for us. Um, now, it does apply for sports photography as well. I don't know if we have any sports photographers in the room, but um, this really can, for you as well, really change. I think sports photographers had the hardest time. There's no real chance to focus and recompose, and many, many photographers that uh, I've worked with um, really kind of, you know, you make a nice picture by taking everything down the middle, but they want to be a little bit more creative, so this has kind of helped them as well. Um, street photography, basically focus is important for every type of, type of uh, genre, right? Now, the way we're able to achieve that eye autofocus, now, it's not entirely based on the mirrorless system, but that does help a lot. So what we've done is actually introduced machine learning and artificial intelligence to build a profile of what people look like, because people are very different. Some people wear glasses, as we saw. Some people might have a mustache or long hair or short hair, and there's a lot of different variations between people out there. So over time, we've been able to create um, a very, very, uh, let's say, sticky autofocus system for to capturing people's faces and tracking human eyes. Um, it also does uh, go ahead and track pattern and eyes. So this is the behind the scenes, pulling back the curtain of our real time tracking system. So if you're into the techie stuff, we can dive into that a little bit more. Essentially, all you have to do is hold the camera up to your subject, half press the shutter, and if you're in real time tracking, which is very simple to do, um, the camera will go, yep, that's an eye. Oh, that person's turned away. Okay, we'll just grab onto the hair. Oh, she's back again, and it will favor the leading eye. So again, these are all things you have to work really, really hard to do um, with previous systems. We're very excited to see that this has been rolled out in firmware updates, forwards and backwards. Now, to see what it looks like in real life, We'll have a little quick sneak peek at this video. I think we're tracking okay. So what we're getting here is that big coverage. Uh, it recognizes an object, then it recognizes a face. Um, and again, the more you can allow your subject to be free, especially if you're into fashion shoots, just family, gone are the days where you know, someone say, hey, stand put, don't move, I gotta get this. It's like, cool, just move around. We can, we can do this, we can achieve this. And again, it's because all that light is getting, hitting the sensor and it's being read and all that information is being synthesized to do the face detection. So that's the big library of images in our cameras um, that allows it to achieve this you know, eye autofocus. 
Now, this is a sports context thing, and I didn't really see anyone, you know, that excited, but it's not just someone twirling around. I'm really big into supporting women's sports because, you know, it's about time. So here we have uh, some field hockey ladies having a play. And again, it's recognizing an object when you see the, this now a face, and then when it goes to the little square, it will be an eye. Now you can see it's not always on eye detect all the time. The eye has to take up uh, a, like enough of the frame to be recognized as the eye. So um, you can see it right here. The photographer probably took their finger off the shutter and then put it back down again, and there we are. So that's a little bit of a different context where all this stuff matters. And it really is driven by that mirrorless system. Cool. This is a little bit, again, behind the scenes. I think that's probably been explained. We're doing pretty well with time. I'm surprised. Usually talk a lot. So uh, no blackout and electronic shutter. What does this mean? So one of the pieces that we have removed, again, well, it's still in there. So we can use a shutter. There is a shutter built into our cameras but our cameras can actually function without a shutter. Um, what does that mean in some of our sports cameras? It means we can achieve very, very fast frames per second in the A9 and the A9 Mark II. Um, if you're into bird photography, we've got cool clips coming up, but you can actually take 20 frames per second without blackout. Um, I'm gonna just do it for fun, and I won't point it at anybody, because I see a bird there. It's waiting for me. It's a perfect, perfect subject um, to, to t demonstrate this. So, no uh, 20 frames per second, I think we all get what that means. But the no blackout is the tricky bit. Now that is pretty poorly lit. Let's see what we can do. Okay, so, yep, it's tracking. Ooh, it's having a hard time tracking with this flare. All right, so that's the bird. I want to take photos, and so I'm taking photos. And it pretty much stuck to the bird. Obviously, the bird's not flying around. But the idea behind that is Sometimes birds do fly around. Most times they fly around. So I'll show you a demonstration of that shortly. With sports photography, wildlife photography, it's all about what we call it the peak of action, right? Right when that bird leaves the branch and, and goes for a fly, or right when that bird swoops on in and the wings are expanded, or in a sports context. So the 20 frames per second, clearly you're not gonna use all those photos, but you only have that one chance as that bird's uh, passing by to get the shot you want. So with that zero blackout, what that means is you're basically looking through a video camera, it, it looks like. You're not getting these blackout marks when you're shooting. So usually you take a photo and it'd go black. The camera would kind of stop working while it saves the image um, and processes the image. Then it'd come back on again and say, oh, there's that person. It used to be here, or that person used to be here, now it's there, or oh, we're black again, and so, this is what you get with a mirror flipping up and down. Now, as we saw, the A9 is here, and the, the camera knows exactly where that, that object is moving because it never went black. So not only is it easier for the photographer to track, but it's easier for the autofocus system to track. So this is the bird I promised. This was not taken by a professional photographer, but one of um, our imaging specialists at Sony. Uh, and this is not a video. This is a series of photos where the bird swooping through. It's getting quite close, and I think the bird was about the size of a fist as it careens around. And I don't know, which photo would you like, right? You go back and you find the one that you like, and the camera will hang on. Now, it did slip out of focus just right there at the very end, but you can see it really unlocks that potential of capturing those moments that are quite fleeting. So it could be a sports journalist uh, camera as well, but right now at the moment, uh, I think with the big long lenses, a lot of bird photographers and wildlife photographers are quite keen to get their hands on this camera. Um, so the other thing happening in the background is that the camera autofocus, as you can see, is still doing a lot of calculations to manage the lens and keep it in focus. Um, cool, silent shooting. So I think it was making noise, wasn't it, before, was it? See. Does that sound like a real noise to anybody? No? Does that sound real? No, it's not real. It's a fake noise. So what we can do is just drive into the camera, turn the audio signals off, and we can start doing some really exciting things, <coughs> like taking silent shots. Um, 
So I promise, I've turned it off, turned it off. It's taking photos, oh, do I plug it in again? No, I'll pass it around. I'm not meant to do this, it's an A9 Mark II, we only have two in the country, but I'll pass it around, you can take a few photos with it. Working silently. Now, why is silence so important? Well, in certain situations, you're not actually allowed to take photographs and make noise. Big example is golf. Uh, proudly to say, proud to say that many golf photographers, uh, top uh, golf photographers, have switched over to Sony, so that they can actually hit, uh, sorry, take a shot while they're in the backstroke and finish it through. Previously, you weren't able to do that because it would distract the golfer. Um, there's a few other scenarios, piano concerts and any kind of concerts like that where it's a little bit quiet, you can jump in there and actually shoot silently. I think one of the most exciting parts for me is actually being in the street. Um, and even if you engage with that person and speak to them, after they hear you take one, two, or three shots, they're kind of over it. And they're kind of like holding a pose, waiting for you to finish, and then they're done. They're like, okay, I'm done now. I'm gonna go on my phone and have a cigarette or do my thing. And maybe that's the shot you want. And so working silently means you can, can actually engage with them, say, yeah, cool, I just wanna take your photo. Yeah, that's cool, yeah, right. You can take four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 13, 14. They're like, are you taking anything? Yeah, yeah, I'm taking photos. And you can just work the scene, work the subject, and again, the camera starts to disappear for you. So that's something that we can achieve with an electronic shutter. Uh, you couldn't do it previously with um, any kind of mirror, uh, mirror mechanism going up and down in a DSLR. Cool, so I've left a lot of time for questions, which is cool with me, because that means we have more time playing if you want. Um, I can take them one at a time, or all at once, what do we say? We have a question over here. Um, this, uh, the difference between the mechanical and the electronic shutter, can you talk about that? Cool, so the question, and this is not just for everyone here, but everyone watching, the question is, what are the main differences between mechanical shutter and electronic shutter? Cool, so the very first difference is that with a mechanical shutter, you can only achieve certain types of shutter speeds. There's a physical limit. I believe it's like one over, ooh, I wanna say 10,000. I have the camera there, we can look at it. So let's just say there's a physical speed in which we can actually run that shutter. With the electronic shutter, if you're outdoors and it's a bright sunny day, you can run it up to one over 30,000th of a second. So you can achieve much faster shutter speeds than previous. So that's, that's one part. What's happening in the camera when we use it? Like, so if everyone's familiar, a, sh a mechanical shutter, the shutter kind of opens up and then the other shutter follows. So it goes click, click. It's usually what it sounds like. What we do in electronic shutter is to simulate that whole like uh, the, that slit happening. So what we do is we turn off the shutter, uh, turn off the sensor completely and we turn it on line by line to mimic an sh uh, actual mechanical shutter. So we're using that control of turning it on and turning it off and reading it to mimic what, uh, what you would get if you're using a mechanical shutter. We can obviously do that very quickly. There are a few drawbacks. Sorry, I'll just finish this one, I'll, I'll come to you next. So one of the questions that does happen is, okay, well what are the limitations of electronic shutter? Uh, so one of the limitations is that you are not able to use, currently not able to use any kind of flash. So you're not able to use flash photography with an electronic shutter. So that'd be probably the key thing to point out. So do you, was there anything else you want to know a little bit about that? Can you set it in camera? I, I'm just trying to think through the Sony menu. Yes, camera. okay, cool. So um, if you have an A7R camera, series camera, or an A7 III, it's called silent mode. So you turn silent on or silent off. And that will trigger electronic shutter. In the A9, you can actually go into, it's the C3 button, and click uh, auto, mechanical, or electronic. And the auto means if you put a flash on it, the camera goes, yep, cool, we'll go back to uh, me mechanical shutter. All right, the question here? You just touched on the, the electronic um, flash synchronization. What happens? How's it work? So, okay, so I'll just restate the question and you tell me if I got it. No, so, what, what it goes reverse back to mechanical? That's shutter, right. Rather than the electronic shutter. So, the question for the room is what happens if you do put a flash and you're using electronic shutter 
on one of our cameras. You've already have it set. If you have it set to auto, it will switch itself to the appropriate shutter. So it will go from electronic shutter right back to mechanical if you have a flash on it. Um, if you change the setting to mechanical, sorry, to, to electronic or silent, you have to change it back. You just have to change it to not silent mode. And then it will work with your flash. Cool. And there was a question here, and then I'll get to you. So one and two. It's kind of a related question. Is yep. the image quality on the electronic shutter and the mechanical shutter the same? Good question. So the question is, is the image quality from using electronic shutter versus mechanical shutter the same? In our previous generation cameras, there was a drop off. So I believe it was, um, let's see, we call it bits. So if you're shooting RAW, I believe it would be a 16-bit raw file is the biggest file that we had in our A72, R2, like that generation of cameras. And then when you went to silent mode, there would be a drop off. I think it would, it would drop down. Um, I could confirm that, but whether it's 14-bit or 16-bit, but essentially there would be a little bit of, of bit depth loss when you would go to silent, shot, uh, silent shooting. In the A9 and the R4, uh, that has been uh, virtually, not virtually eliminated, but has been, that gap has been closed. So there is some drop off in bit depth. Uh, there was one there, sir, and then two back there. So go ahead. Could you um, tell us about tethered shooting? Sure, I can tell you a little bit about tethered shooting. Cool. Thank you. All right. So the question is about tethered shooting. So tethered shooting is usually used in a studio environment. So um, that's usually when you're working with a little bit of a set, maybe you're doing a portrait or a fashion shoot, and you want to actually be connected to a laptop. There's a lot of advantages of working directly from a laptop versus, <laughs> versus the camera. So um, we do have tethering capabilities in our R3, R4, A9, and all those tethering capabilities, so actually in the 7.2 as well. So you can go ahead and plug into a, a laptop via our Imaging Edge software. So it's free for everyone. So you can download that, have it on your PC. And there's a few smaller apps within that overarching Imaging Edge software. So that allows you to capture, allows you to edit, allows you to view the photos um, as you're taking them. Does that uh, address most of the questions? So Imaging Edge is the one you want to look for. And that question there? Just, just interested in some strategies around sort of, you know, a number of us will have a big investment in lenses, and I don't want to change the body, but are there converters for the lenses? Um, you know. Okay, I think I follow. So the question is, uh, if you are going to switch over to Sony, and you maybe have some legacy glass or legacy lenses, and you're not sure what that's going to cost you at the start to switch over, what kind of adapters are available? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, well, they're not going to build legacy lenses. They're good lenses. It's right. Just like in, in other brands' lenses, is what I'm saying. Yeah, so, so non-Sony lenses, let's say. Um, because we have no mirror box, that means that there is opportunity to get adapters, third-party adapters, to adapt third-party lenses to Sony cameras. That's because the, we call it flange distance, the distance between the mount and where the sensor sits is quite short compared to um, a traditional DSLR where there's actually kind of a bigger gap between the sensor and that. Uh, the mount. So there's two types of adapters. One's called a dummy adapter. It literally just holds a gap required for the lens to project onto the sensor at the appropriate distance. So every brand would have a specific distance you need to cover and allows you to use a Sony camera with third party lenses, uh, non native lenses. Uh, if you want to spend a little bit more money, uh, those dummy adapters don't do any kind of autofocus, they're very inexpensive. Very easy to find. You can get some pretty funky results if you go with like a really, really old vintage lens or something like that. Um, but if you want to really take advantage of all the autofocus that we talked about, um, native Sony lenses would probably be the best result. There are smart adapters that I think Michael's probably be a little bit more appropriate to answer. But some smart adapters that allow you s those lenses to be used in autofocus. Now, um, there's a lot of non-Sony lenses out there. I think we could all agree. I'm not across every single one of them, but there are some compatibility, compatibility issues at times where certain, certain lenses, if you go far back enough, won't really, really play nicely with your adapter or a Sony camera. 
which is something we really can't control. But I can assure you that uh, we have plenty of lenses that are native that would probably suit most of your needs. But I do appreciate the fact that it does take, like, there's a, there's a you don't want to let go of your lenses if you don't have to, right? And so, yes, if that's what you're after, right. So some people do like manual focus, so I don't know. All right. Uh, a question up here and then two in the back, yeah. Can you just talk about pixel shift? Can I talk about pixel shift? I can. I got three minutes. We could do this. All right. Uh, so pixel shift, all right. There's a, I'll talk about the, do you have an R4 or R3? Or are you thinking of it? Three. You have an R3, okay. So um, everyone's qu probably quite familiar with um, pixel shift in a way where you take, uh, you set up the camera, you press the button, and it takes a series of, let's say, five or six images, and it will shift the, the sensor just by maybe a pixel, <laughs> hence pixel shift, in five different directions so that it can kind of create a much larger picture. But the R3 does it in a way where actually it's not getting a larger megapixel picture, but a deeper color information uh, photo. So what, what you're trying to do there is on the sensor itself, we had to put, or not we, but just about every manufacturer to generate color photographs has to put what's called a Bayer array, which is an assortment of, of well, uh, lenses that are colored over the sensor. So you get little squares of green, little squares of red and blue, and all that stuff is calculated and out comes a color picture. However, with that Bayer array, you, it is a little bit of a guess. You're like, okay, we're, we're doing some math here and we can tell you that like, that orange is an orange uh, based on all the math we're running. Um, it is a little bit of a deeper question, but essentially what we're doing in pixel shift in your camera, the A7R4, is we're taking a bunch of photos that kind of get, eliminate the guessing. So it'll take a series of photos in the camera. You go into imaging edge as well. You load the cameras, uh, load the photos into that software. At that point, what the software will do is goes, cool, we don't need to guess. We know where all these pixels are. So Again, you're getting basically full color information out of your sensor. So it has to be on the tripod. It has to be on the tripod. Nothing in the photo needs to be moving. So it's really aimed at your still life and uh, photographer, studio photographer, who are just kind of, everything's clamped down. Um, I know Mark Gala. I don't know if anyone knows Mark Gala here personally or knows of his tutorials online. He's a great resource. He's had to go and try to do pixel shift in a landscape situation. It's a very advanced thing to do. But yeah, you get some wind moving in the trees and then it goes a little bit funny. But um, it can be done, but it's really aimed at still life photography. Uh, I think we have enough time for maybe one question. I did see someone over somewhere, no? Okay, there. Uh, RX-10 Got any tips? Okay. So the RX10 Mark IV, uh, I think this question is a little bit more specific. But so I, could, if I, well, I got like a minute left. Um, maybe I will take that one to the side. But uh, the RX10 Mark IV is, ooh, we have a Mark, you have a Mark III. So I have a Mark IV here. Um, I'm just glad you called it out. So for traveling, it's excellent, of course, it has it's just the one lens built in. It gives you 24 mil to 600 mil focal length. I think what, uh, what you probably want to think about straight away is you want to go for a wide zone. So a lot of times people pick a small spot focus point and try to like move it around. Um, at 600 mil, any slightest movement is a massive movement in real life. So I feel like that would be the starting point. Autofocus continuous. I would have it on wide. Uh, maybe I'd have it on tracking, um, those kind of things. But it, it, it's a tricky thing, shooting at 600 mil. <laughs> no matter how small the camera is, it can be tricky. So I think that's it for my time. I see the quadruple zeros over there. Thank you so much. I hope you had a good time. And uh, I'll be here. <laughs>